comes out of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the Word of God. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, its master needs it and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside the street and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, why, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat upon it. Many people spread their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed, uh, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Open our ears, O Lord, to hear your word and know your voice. Speak to our hearts and strengthen our wills that we may serve you today, now, and always. Amen. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of, or we as a family, had a privilege of taking Dean to Western Carolina University to check out their campus. It's Alicia's alma mater. We had a great campus tour, and it was amazing to see the growth of the school since Alicia graduated from there. The dorms that she stayed in, they no longer exist. New ones that kind of look like designer mountain retreat centers now are in their place. But for Alicia and I brought back lots of memories from our college years as we walked around. We shared stories with our kids whether they cared or not. What it was like back in our day, back in the 1900s walking this campus. It was a great, great trip down memory lane. Alicia and I started to date my senior year, her junior year of high school, and so by the time she got to Western, I was at Montreat College, which was exactly about 58 and a half minutes away. <laughs> so we had been dating a couple of years. Back then, you know, we didn't have cell phones, and so I had a calling card that I would call to make uh, long-distance calls to her, and I had memorized the 16 digits of that card and plus the seven of her phone number, and I could dial that all about three seconds to get a hold of her. But we would talk every a few times a week, and back then, we would do the common silly things that all teenagers heavily in love would do, like, no, you, you hang up first. <laughs> but I wonder what kids these days do as they are falling madly in love with one another. Are they texting and saying, no, you stop texting. No, you stop Snapchatting. But no matter how we communicate, whether it's through a long-distance phone card or through Snapchat, these days we do the same thing. As people fall in love, they do silly things. And they continue to make that person that they are falling in love with a focus above all else. I'm sure you could look back at your life and when you fell in love and think about all the silly things you did. But falling in love is an amazing moment in people's lives. It's exciting, it's, it's thrilling, it's exhilarating. It can consume your entire life and all of a sudden, the only person that you think about is the one that you've fallen in love with. The world revolves around that person. Now the funny thing is, is that we think falling in love is all about the other person, but in reality, it's all about us. When we fall in love, we love the feelings that we have within ourselves and the feelings that this new person brings out in us. The process of falling in love says that this other person makes me feel good. This person brings something out of me that I, I never knew existed. 
Falling in love says that when I am with this person, I can't believe how I feel. It's about me, myself, and I. Yet it, yet it is a very superficial love. Falling in love is a shallow idea of love. Falling in love is not the same as just love. Walter Wangerin is a Lutheran pastor who wrote a book on marriage, and in that book he says this, love lies a little. Love, the desire to like and be liked, feels so good when it's satisfied that it can never want, that it never wants to stop. Therefore, love edits the facts in order to continue to feel good. When falling in love, that process, we focus on the self and we get those love goggles on because we cannot see reality that we are surrounded by. That, I mean, others can see it. Friends can see another one in a relationship and wonder, well, I wonder how long that's going to last. They will see the other and they'll see the damage and the change it has on that person's life. But when you're neck deep falling in love, you can't see it. Rarely do you have that perspective. Our heart tells us little lies. Oh, it's cute how jealous he gets. He really loves me. Not the fact that he has issues with control. Oh, I think it's just so wonderful. She checks up on me so many times during the day. Not that she has trust issues. But all these little lies fail into comparison to the biggest one so many of us tell ourselves. I know I can change him. Oh, I know I can change her. Falling in love likes to make us believe that line, hook, line, and sinker. But falling in love is not love. Today is Palm Sunday. It is the start of Holy Week, the holiest week of the Christian year. It is the week that we celebrate. We wave palms today as Jesus rides into Jerusalem. There is so much hope and joy on this Sunday. And we try and re-invoke that, that feeling on the road in Jerusalem by handing out palms and having our children parade around the sanctuary and our choir sing beautiful music. We celebrate that Jesus is going into the holy city because we know this arrival changes the world. On that road, there were a lot of people who were falling in love with Jesus. They loved the idea that Jesus was the Messiah. They loved the idea that a revolution was about to start. They loved the idea that Jewish people had been under so much, the rule of so many other governments that now the Messiah, God's Son, was coming to free them for good. They were falling in love with the idea of this Messiah. But their eyes were covered with love goggles that blinded them to the reality of who Jesus truly was. But as they laid their cloaks on the ground, as they laid the palm branches down and the donkey trampled over them, they knew they could change him. Or at least that's the lie their hearts were telling themselves. You see, people on the side of the road had this idea of who Jesus was. They had an idea of who they wanted Jesus of Nazareth to be. They wanted a superhero type of Messiah. They wanted a Thor, an Iron Man, a Hulk, Captain America, all the other Avengers wrapped up into one. They had this idea that Jesus would pick up a sword and cut the heart out of Caesar and the Roman government, release the captives and set them free to be their own country, God's nation once again. This is the person they laid the branches down for and their cloaks down for. This is the person who they were falling in love with. This is the person that Peter falls in love with on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's there on the mountain and withstanding the presence of Jesus, unveiling his divine side, and he said, this is a good place to be. Let's put up some tents and stay here forever. This is a comment of a teenager who is falling head over heels in love but doesn't understand reality. Then in a blink of an eye, it was just him, James, John, and Jesus again, and they started to head back down the mountain. When the religious authorities approached Judas, they spoke to a man falling in love with Jesus. 
Judas was a zealot, which means he had great passion for his cause. He was following Jesus because he knew Jesus was going to change the world. He had all the right ideas, but he's falling in love with Jesus, and that process blinded him. He thought in his head, I can change him. He thought he could force his hand and make Jesus choose to toss the religious leaders out who held their faith captive by their rules and regulations. Jesus was going to get rid of the Romans who were choking his people. Jesus was going to do all of this. All he needed, all he needed was just a little push. So 30 pieces of silver was all he needed to betray Jesus, and he sold them out. Now, we may not be Judas or Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration or the people on the road who saw Jesus ride by, but we have our false ideas of who Jesus is. Our falling in love with Jesus has blinded us to the true reality of God's Son, Jesus the Christ. And it is deep in our hearts that we look at Christ and we think, I can still change him. In a blog post entitled, Why Falling in Love May Be Sort of a Myth, the author writes that there comes a point when love moves beyond falling in love. After the arguments, after the struggles, after life settles in, there's only one way to continue. The author writes, the only way to rise to the challenge of love is to rise and serve. Another way to put it is, falling in love is an emotion, and love is an action. Jesus headed into Jerusalem to show us what God's love looks like, and it wasn't what we expected. It was heading that way when he threw everyone out of the temple. And by the end of the week, things were going to be, or were not going like people thought, and they decided they really wanted to change him. Even though on numerous occasions he told his disciples that the Son of Man would have to be lifted up, he told them he was going into Jerusalem and he's going to suffer and die and rise again on the third day, but their falling in love goggles blinded them to that reality. Yet Jesus doesn't do what we want. He does what we need. You see, when you move from falling in love to love, it moves the focus from yourself to someone else. When I was falling in love with Alicia, I was focused on how that made me feel. But now, 30 years later, I show love by rising and serving. I show love by honoring and serving her. It isn't about me anymore. It is about her. Falling in love is, a sentiment, is sentimental, but God's love is sacrificial. And when we fall in love with God, we are focused on what God's love does to us and for us. But then as we grow, we live out God's love by focusing more on how we can honor and serve God. Jesus shows us how to do that this week. His love for us leads us, leads him to the cross on Friday. His suffering, death, and his sacrifice are all about his love for us. Those who have a shallow or cheap love for God are the ones who are in the crowd waving palms and laying their cloaks on the ground on Sunday, and then on Friday, they're in the same crowd yelling, crucify him because Jesus isn't doing what they want. If we let the love of God wash over us, transform us, and mold us into his likeness, then we can learn to love like God. In my 20 plus years of ministry, I have seen people do this. I have seen it in the love of a daughter has for her mother and that as her mother is dying, she crawls into bed with her and holds her. And although she hasn't been able to recognize her in months because of the, the disease that has claimed her mind, she holds her tight in her last moments. I've seen it on the faces of a mother and father who have to decide to pull their 17-year-old off of life support and to donate her organs. I've seen it with a husband who is holding the hand of his wife who is coming to grips with being paralyzed from the waist down. I've seen it in the eyes of parents who 
were holding their two-pound baby, wondering if she would survive, and only a few months later, passing her to me to baptize. You see, God's love can infect us deeply if we let it. We can move past the lies of falling in love tells us if we start to love like God and not hope God can be made into something that we desire. Instead of thinking that we can change God, how about we just let God change us? This Holy Week, that is my hope. That is my prayer, that you will open yourself up to that chance. Please don't jump from today to Easter Sunday. Please join us on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Please go take the Stations of the Crosswalk out in our own field. It can be heavy, it can be deep, it can be moving. Yet that is when the reality of God's love sets in. And on Easter morning, God's grace will just flow. If you skip through from the party today to the party next Sunday, you'll miss on the sacrificial love of God, the true love. True love that shows up as a four-year-old who sees his elderly neighbor crying. The man just lost his wife. And seeing the man cry, the little boy walks over to the older man's yard, climbs into her lap, his lap, and just sits there. And when the mother asked what he said to his neighbor, the little boy said, nothing, I just helped him cry. That, that is God's love. And so as we start this week, may we be transformed by God's love found in Jesus Christ. May we be moved beyond falling in love with God to understanding and living out the love of God in everything we do and in all the ways we are who we are. And all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for being you and not being the God of our own design and our own desires. And so as we walk with you hand in hand this week, maybe for the first time, may we be transformed by the gifts we receive today as you enter Jerusalem for the grace that is found in the last meal in the upper room. Witnessing the travel from light, from light to darkness on Good Friday and to come to the tomb together on Easter morning. Lord, may we feel your love within our hearts and may we move beyond just simply falling in love with you to actually being your love in this world. It is in your name we pray. Amen.